Reading SC left Nottingham Forest with just a point for their troubles after a very solid performance. Saw too many chances go begging to maintain the Royals' winning streak. Welcome to the Tarnas Then Podcast, episode 257, the podcast by Reading fans. For Reading fans, I'm your host, Mark Mayo, and joining me to discuss... Well, obviously, we've got the game, we've got a bit of mailbag, but also we've got a little bit more of a, of news from the Supporters Trust Association of Reading Star, that is, and doing that with me, is Roger Tipford. How's it going, mate? It's good. It's good. Good to see you, Mark. And also joining us this week, the Tyler Sends View from the Dolan, or View from wherever his living room is at the moment, is Ben Thomas. How are you, mate? <laughs> yeah, I'm good, thanks, Mark. It's um, yeah, nice point yesterday and keeps it ticking over, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm all good, thank you. Yeah, well, we'll get that into that into a second. As I say, there's a bit of a stuff going on in Star and, and the supporter world at the moment, which we'll get into a bit later. And also a, a game on Wednesday night, which might have just this afternoon been getting a bit more interesting. So talk about that in a bit. Let's go into the recap then. Before we do that, thank you, as always, to our Patreon subscribers and our sponsor, ZCZ Films. So with that in mind, let's go and talk about a 1-1 draw at the City Ground. Come rain or shine, it's time to relive the latest match action with the recap. This podcast is sponsored by ZCZ Films, Reading's oldest ultras. So this game then, where do I begin? Perhaps with the diamond, which we kept from the last week. But really, I don't think there was any complaints about that. You know, we kind of, we spoke about on last week's show, the sense of going, going back to the the three-man attack with perhaps players being fit. In the end, Jack Umese being on the bench, um, obviously came off, scored the winner, but obviously wasn't, you know, probably wasn't deemed to be fit enough to start. Um, so I think, Ben, if I bring you in first, what was the, what were the, before we got to the equaliser, what was the kind of main thing that, that you kind of took out of this game? Because for me, it's the finishing and I'll, I'll run through it in a second. But if there's any, you know, is there anything aside from the finishing that you're going to start with before we get with, get into that? Um, I actually quite enjoyed the game, to be honest. I um, I thought it was thoroughly entertaining, you know, from from both sides. And I kind of, I think uh, we, we got more than, than we probably bargained for from Forrest, who've been absolutely dreadful. And, I, you know, as, as in their last outing against Watford, I don't think they had a, a shot on target. So... You know the fact they were kind of going for it quite early in the game was was quite interesting, really, and I, I think we coped with it reasonably well. Um, there was there was no reason from from Panovic's point of view to to change the formation or or, or the players that were playing in it. Really, uh, I was quite pleased that we were able to to keep a settled side. I'm still not completely sold on on the diamond, really, and I think you know as we'll we'll come on to it in a minute. But it it just felt like when we were going forward. Um, particularly with, with Puskas and Jala just kind of got in each other's ways a little bit really and obviously the finishing wasn't quite there but we, we just looked um, a lot more potent when we had ironically the, the kind of three up front um, and, and, and we looked more kind of capable of, of scoring a goal and obviously ended up doing that so yeah it was um, it was a mixed bag really the, the, you, I don't think you can knock the application or the, the endeavour or the desire of the players like we have done maybe in, in previous games Um you know, in, in losses like Wickham, for example. But the, you know, that, that was a game that really we probably could have scored three or four goals in had everyone been, um, you know, in the right mindset to to score the goals and finish them, really. Yeah, it was an inter- interesting one because, yeah, I, I agree. Our grip on the game and everything like that was perfectly good. Um, defensively, we were organised enough and Forrest were decent. You know, this is a, this is a Chris Hewton team. They're... If you're thinking about next season, there's no reason to think that they won't be in and in and around the general playoff picture because they've got such a good manager, and that's you know that's that's how much it takes in the championship to be in the picture and you know the, to to create as many chances as we did, I thought was pretty a, a really good effort. And this is the this is what it boils down to for me is that the quality of the finishing. You know, if you if you get your shot off. And you know the keeper saves it. Then yeah, fair play. Ironically, the goal we scored was not a case of, of fair play to the goalkeeper. I was just looking at, on who scored at the moment. Actually, the stats website for some reason have given an error leading to the goal to the centre back. And as far as I'm aware, he wasn't in goal at the time that it happened. But anyway, the before all of that, Lucas Shaw created a really good dribble through the box into the box and fluffed the connection for his strike. Then we created a really good corner routine, went to Zhao, who fluffed the connection for his strike. 
George Bush Gas later on went to a one on one and they said on commentary it bobbled. I think it's just a bouncing ball. Fluffed the connection for his strike when miles over the bar. Yaku Mate then had a decent opening later on and just air kicked. And Roger, it was quite amazing how it wasn't that we were testing the goalkeeper so much as getting into great possess- positions and just not making good quality connections with the ball. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was one right at the end where Jao uh, hit a defender with a shot in injury time. I have to say, I thought the first 15 minutes we were really good. And yet we conceded three chances to them, you know, quite quickly after that. But I thought we flowed very well for the first 15 minutes. And I didn't feel that we missed Ijaria or Inamoto at all in in that midfield. We were moving forward very well. Like you say, it it felt like one of those days where, oh, crikey, are we ever going to score? You know, the one that Lucas Jow, you know, got into a tangle with in the first half that hit the post. And you've not mentioned the um, uh, Yidham one that also beat the goalkeeper on the yeah. near post, hit the near post and came out again. So by the end of it, I was really pleased we actually did score because um, it looked like one of those days you, where you were never going to score. On the other hand, I was frustrated again. You know, two more points gone. And you kind of add that to the two at Sheffield, the three at Wickham, the two at Preston that have all gone, you know, begging in these away games. Yeah, and I suppose it's that, it's we've discussed it before, haven't we? It's that thing that maybe against Sheffield Wednesday a couple of weeks ago, the team that wins the league might win that 5-0 rather than 3-0. And the team that wins the league probably beats Forest, or even if they'd gone a goal down, um, they get that second goal. And we there was so much space in, after the level. And let's talk about that, actually, as the goal itself. And it felt like the space just opened up so nicely. And Yakumete coming off the bench, yes, the goalkeeper made an error from it. But I don't think the, the quality of the move was certainly very good, Ben. And to, to have that moment as well, and, and as Roger was saying, that was it ever going to be our day? And to then actually have that, you know, that enjoyment of the leveller was was a lot of, it was a lot of relief as well, wasn't it? But I think the thing with it is that, you know, we, we, we've been on the show before and I've, I've spoken to you about it, Mark, and, and the criticism of, of either the lack of subs or the timing of the subs or the personnel change. And I think yesterday with the with the two subs that, that, that made the difference, you know, with Mate first and then obviously Aluko coming on, they were, they were spot on in terms of timing, but also the players that he took off for them as well. Um, just just going back to the point about the diamond, the, the reason it doesn't work for me is is because of the three defensive midfield players. And, you know, McIntyre is 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 a lot more competent on the ball than I would say Samido is, um, whichever the way you look at it. And there are times, you know, and Roger kind of mentioned it as well, but after that, the first 15 minutes, Samido just got lost in the game, really. And I think positioning-wise, again, they just they kind of all looked all over the place. Loren was 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 you know was very industrious but was very quiet, um, and and that's why it kind of didn't work for me really because it it, it all got a bit jumbled in that in that middle section there. Um, it, it, in terms of the goal itself, I mean it was it was a great finish really. Um, you know he put his foot right through it. Horrific goalkeeping either way you look at it. Absolutely dreadful and you know it couldn't happen to a better bloke really given the the track record that we've had with Samba over the years and. Um, you know, the alleged banter, shall we say. But yeah, I mean, it was it was the right time to score. I, I really felt at that point that we would go on and get another one. Um, you know, and we've talked about those kind of later missed chances, but it, it after we scored, it did feel like two points dropped, really. Um, that said, you know, up until we scored, I, just, I didn't feel like we were going to lose the game. You know, we did look reasonably comfortable. We looked quite, you know... Um, Attack minded, so it was it was great to to get the goal at that point, and and fantastic for Mate, and he is, you know, he's rapidly becoming um, a, a cult hero for us, really, because he he just gives it so much. He's an incredibly likable guy, you know. I've met him a few times in in passing, and he's just you know wonderful to to kind of chat to, and you know the way that he is with the fans and and the rest of the team. So it, it's brilliant to have him back, and and hopefully he's in a position now where. He's got the goal, he's got a bit of confidence, he's got a bit more fitness in the legs and he will be able to, to hopefully start in, in one of the next two games that we've got coming up because with him in the team, we, we do look um, you know, a lot more potent with, with the other players around him. So hopefully this will be the start of his revival this season and he can kind of really cement our place in the playoffs and who knows, maybe a little bit higher up. Yeah, I agree, Ben. I spot, spot on. I was really pleased to see him back and he looked pretty fit to me, actually. 
no sign of injury at all there, the way he's moving around. And yeah, he is somebody who just gets goals, you know, and you you just got to love him for that. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? And when it comes to Wednesday night, we've got Birmingham away, although, you know, whether it's away or home, it doesn't really matter these days. And it's a game again that we have to go and attack and win. The diamond formation, I agree that, I mean, this is the inherent problem of diamond formations is that the ball just gets stuck in the middle and creating space is so difficult to do so when teams sit back. So where, I mean, Rinomoto would come in for Samedo in my ideal team anyway. I think, as you've said, Samedo, he, he's not, I just don't rate him as, as much of a player as, as the likes of Rinomoto as well. So does Mate, is he okay to come in alongside Jao? Is it that we play a kind of 4 3 3 or well, effectively a kind of 4 2 3 1 with at least, say, kind of floating in behind and um, three men up front, maybe Puskas, Meite, and Zhao? That, does that really work? I'm not sure that you could have all three of them up front together. No. I don't know. I think you'd have to take Puskas out. I think, I, I don't think, I don't know if Roger agrees with this, but yesterday just wasn't his day really. And, you know he he was he was great in in the previous few games and obviously got the match winner a couple of you know a couple of games ago but uh, I, I, for me if Mayte's fit he has to start it's the same with if if Renamota's fit he has to start um, and and who you take out is kind of inconsequential really because for me those those players we need to build our team around those players um, you know not just this season but moving forwards um, I think I think Jao was just about done enough again I don't think he had a great game yesterday and what. I know what concerns, I know we talked about this last time, concerns about his kind of attitude and, and not so much application, but, you know, he misses a few and he goes missing and then it, it all gets a bit turgid up the top, really. Um, and, you know, with, with Elise there, you've always got opportunities to to score because he he had a lot of the ball yesterday and he was kind of driving forward and and taking players on. So for me, if Mate's fit, he starts, who you take out, you know, I, I, I don't think it really matters, but he's got to be in the starting eleven. Yeah, I'd, I'd put Mate in over Puskas because there's more goals there. The other thing we haven't mentioned is, ha- given you were talking about the diamond, is how well our fullbacks got forward yesterday, particularly in the first half. You know, the number of crosses that came in from both flanks, from uh, from Yadam and, and Richards. I thought that was uh, a very important feature of our attacking play. Well, I was going to say, actually, because Yudon, I thought Andy Yudon was the best player on the pitch on Saturday. And I thought this before the Nottingham Forest home commentators started getting really angry with him. And I think that <laughs> you could did, tell, yeah. you could tell really that was how good he was playing by how much they moaned about him. So, yeah, some of the decisions of whatever, um, 50-50s and all sorts, and they felt he should have been booked and whatever. But I think because he got he sticks so much inside their head, I, you could tell that was a sign of, and he hit the post. And just generally speaking, I think it, it you know, Tom Holmes is a good player, but I feel for me it kind of puts to bed the who should be our first choice right back uh, you know, um, debate because he just he was just all round class for me on on Saturday. Yeah, and I, you know, I I feel I feel really, it's bizarre. I feel really protective over Tom Holmes because obviously we're in a situation in this season where you know it's not been officially announced, but we know that Richard is is leaving, and that's it. And I just because of our track record, I just don't want to lose these young players and I just want to keep them there. And, I, you know, it, 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 it's obvious, you know, Yudom is, is fantastic. And yesterday was his, was by far and away his best game since he's been back from from long-term injury. But you, you, you just hope that that somewhere Holmes can keep getting games. And the same with McIntyre, really, because I'm, for me, I'm just desperate to keep both of those players because of what they bring both on and off the pitch. Um, I thought I thought Yudom, you know, was, as I said, was absolutely excellent. Really, really great. You know, I know he should have probably been booked, but I thought the ref was excellent yesterday on a side note. I thought it was absolutely superb. Um, the only thing I would I would say and, and slightly disagree with Roger is that I felt that that with the goal that we conceded, Richard was at fault for that because there's no way that he was going to be able to match up physically um, at that point. And it, it just seemed more sensible to try and tackle and, and clear the ball rather than challenge him the way that he did. But, you know, it, it happened. Move on, learn from it. But yeah, I mean, year on yesterday was was easily the best player on the pitch. Yeah. I I'd agree on the on the goal. I would say generally speaking that when Amiobi gets into that position, there's no real complaints. I think it was technically a Tom Holmes own own goal, but if yeah, if he can back heel it off the line from that position, then good luck to him. But yeah, it, it felt to me like a bit of we've talked about com- confidence in terms of Omar Richards recently. 
brilliant that he's got that confidence and he's played really well. And it, on the ball and everything, I've no complaints on the weekend. But yeah, I'd agree that at the end of the day, I think Amiobi is 30 pounds heavier than he is. And he just tried to barge into him and, and impact him that way. And it's no surprise he lost, really. Um, one last couple points to make then on the game. Obviously, huge, huge missed opportunity to win. I think we, we, we touched on that. Um, Lucas Shaw, as we said, shot late on and we had a couple of free kicks that were missed. Um, I wanted to, I don't know what you guys thought of the Yaku Mese free kick right at the end. And I thought it was actually really intelligent what he did because on the face of it, he's obviously just belted it at the keeper and the keeper saved it. But with Samba, he is, you know, he's, he's what football manager will probably class as eccentric in his quality of his saves. You know, it's either all or nothing really, isn't it? And to hit it hard and low at the keeper, with I think Zhao was the first man following in. I think that was the best, you know, best thing he could have done because if he spills it, then you've got to tap in. And that's such a, I feel like that's such a good technique. I don't know if you guys were at that moment berating, you know, it, or, or felt that it was a bad decision, but I felt like it was probably the best thing he could have done. Oh, no, I was crying out for somebody different to take the free kicks. Um, I'm glad to see that we switched the penalty taker uh, for the uh, last home game. And I think it's good to get somebody else on free kicks because I'm afraid, you know, Michael Elise hasn't really, for me, come close at all with, um, you know, free kicks. And he must have had a dozen by now. Yeah, no, it feels to me as if he's kind of, I don't know with Elise, is it... it I don't, I'd love to do a deep dive into it and say maybe is it an experience thing because he kind of tends to overhit a lot of them. Um, and, you know, it's the pressure in the moment. Obviously, he looked very unhappy when he overhit the one against Forrest because he knows of the. It was basically perfectly directed, just he hit it too hard. So, yeah, I don't know whether, it's, whether it comes down to experience. Obviously, John Swift, if he's in the team, is the, uh, is the first choice. But, um, yeah, the final point I'd say before we listen to Velka Panovic's quotes in just a second and go into the mailbag. But final point I'd say is the Reading are now five points clear of seventh. Um, so technically moving in the right direction. We'll talk about in the mailbag about exactly the teams around us. Um, and also it's the first time we've avoided defeat away to a Chris Hewton team. Five games previously we've played the likes of Birmingham and Newcastle, etc. And we've always, uh, always lost. So that's, that's a, a good yeah. stat. That's a very good stat, actually. So that's, I like that. that's a step in the right direction, at least, or maybe it's a step in the wrong direction with Chris Hewitt. Maybe that's what it shows. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's hear from Velko Panovic now, and then we'll be into the mailbag. I think uh, we throw away the first half. I think we could have done much more. We should have been much more ruthless, much more clinical. All those opportunities, some of them from set plays that we prepared should have been better executed at the end. Uh, but I think the team played very well. The team, as always, uh, gave his best and, uh, and we ended up again uh, in, in their box, uh, where speaks uh, volumes about our identity, about our character, about our approach and style to win every single game. We weren't content with the with the with the draw, and uh, we pushed forward. I think there was a very good. Uh, th- there were very good moments in the second half where we created a bunch of opportunities. Unfortunately, only one we converted. Very happy for Yaku Meite returning with a goal. Very happy also that uh, uh, there was a good partnership today between him and and Luca Jao. Uh, although with with George also we had in the first half very good uh, spells uh, or very good combinations in the final third. I think, uh, yeah, there are a lot of positives, but games like this, you can't help but feel like you lost it. Keep up to date with all things Reading FC. Follow The Tilehurst End on Facebook and Twitter. Tom is going to start us off this week and he's asking, how nervy are we all with just a few games left? And again, a little too close for comfort for fifth and sixth place. Well, we are currently on 61 points with plus 12 goal difference, eight points off a second, five points off a fourth, um, fourth and third. Uh, Brentford and Swansea both have a game in hand, so I wouldn't really count, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about closing them down too much just yet. And as Tom says, Barnsley on uh, sixth, with 61 points and plus six goal difference. So they have levelled us up, but goal difference, they don't quite score as many as us, so they're behind. Bournemouth are five points behind. They've got a plus 
15 goal difference. Cardiff are uh, seven points behind. They've got plus 17 goal difference. So if they were to catch us, you know, the goal difference would probably jump them over us. So it's, as I said, the, the gap has grown. Cardiff actually lost to Watford on the weekend. So I suppose, you know, that's pretty much a good thing, isn't it, really? But um, yeah, it's it, it feels like I, I'm just about, Roger, comfortable with this gap at the moment. Um, yeah, I think we're in the contest with Barnsley and Bournemouth for two places, you know, fifth, sixth and seventh. Um, the historic yardstick is 74, 75 points. So we need 15 more, which is five wins from 10 games and five defeats from, from 10 games. So, you know, the, the, the stats are in our favour. Uh, the only thing that worries me is that Bournemouth, I think, um, as an ex recent ex Premier League club, will have a great deal of motivation to try and get back into that frame. Um, and five points, you know, ain't a lot if you lose two games and they win two games, is it? Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd be very miserable if we didn't make the playoffs, not to say. Yeah, that's the thing. And I, I, I still worry about Bournemouth just having that extra gear in them somehow, losing to Barnsley. On the weekend, Ben, I guess it's probably a good thing. We'll probably take Barnsley in the playoffs. It, it, for me, it's irrelevant whether we finish fifth or sixth because it's going to be you know, whether we play Watford, Swansea, or Brentford in the playoffs. I don't think it really matters. Obviously, you know, home and away again probably wouldn't really matter. So, it's, if that's kind of how it is, then uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll definitely take it. Yeah, I think it, in one respect there is um, there were some not great results for us over the weekend. And quite a few late goals with, with teams that we probably could have done without, uh, you know, no scoring those goals and getting the points. Um, you know, think about Watford and, and Barnes in particular. But you know, that said, it, it does simplify uh, you know the playoff picture a little bit for me. I think probably Cardiff are just about enough out of reach to potentially say another loss and they're they're out of the running. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Bournemouth have had a very up and down season. I think, you know, in terms of consistency, they, they haven't quite got there really. Obviously changed their manager, which is a, a brave uh, thing to do at this point. You know, obviously when they when they came to us, they were on really quite quite a poor run and, and we absolutely savaged them that day, you know, on a Friday night. Um, if we're looking at the playoffs, which it, it looks like it will be because I think probably, you know, well, I know that Norwich are done now. They're, they're gone either way. Um, it looks quite tight for second there, obviously with Watford, Swansea, and, and Brentford. But you know, if we can make up the ground to, to fourth place, that would probably be quite a nice position for us to be in. Because you're right, out of out of the current playoff pitch, you'd probably want to play Barnsley. You know, no disrespect to them, but in terms of track records of the other teams, you don't really want to touch them. So it, uh, you know, I, I, it is difficult, and I, I, I'm more nervy from a where will we finish and who will end up playing point of view. I I feel. I know, obviously, it was two points dropped for, for most people yesterday, but I just feel the resilience that we showed and the kind of application that we showed in yesterday's game tells me that we've got enough to to end in the playoffs. It's just more a question of, you know, who, who we're going to end up playing. And, and and those teams are really, really strong. You know, Swansea, Brentford and and, and Watford. Um, and either way, looking at it, that's going to be an incredibly tough semi-final let alone the, you know, the hopeful final at the end of it. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult. Um, Five wins from ten games, as, as Roger said, is very, very doable, and I, I, I see us doing that. Um, it's, it's whether or not Bournemouth can break in and, and, and replace someone that isn't us, <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm certainly very happy for for Barnsley to stay in. Like they have done, obviously, a hugely, incredibly amazing job. Whether they can see that through for the final ten games or not, you know, it's up to the gods, as far as I'm concerned. We'll play them at some point. I know in the next few weeks, but. Um, yeah, well, let, let me put it this way. Uh, Laura will say, um, if we draw all of the rest of our matches of the season, will we go up? That'll put us on 71 points and that probably wouldn't be enough. You'd imagine that Bournemouth have enough, you know, they can get they can get 16 points out of the last 10 games quite easily. So I don't think that would be enough. Although obviously, you know, Laura was kind of joking in that. But Sean Burgess saying, with 10 games to go, what are your predictions for who will join Norwich and then the playoff winner in the, in the, in the playoffs? Um I'll interrupt you with a little stat there, Mark, if I may. In, when we no went up in 2002, out of the last 10 games, we did we won one. <laughs> Which is unbelievable for a team winning promotion. <laughs> we drew the other nine. 
Yeah, well, that's um, I think we we are uh, well limping across the line and falling, coming uh, coming fourth in three horse races is certainly something that Reading are very capable of <laughs> of, of, of doing <laughs> historically. Um, but no, in, in terms of you know, as as we kind of said that if it's Reading versus Brentford as it stands at the moment, and Barnsley versus Swansea, um, I would I would expect it. You probably would have to expect Brentford to feel that that final place. Um, they've had a little bit of a wobble recently. To be honest, it's the last two playoff finals have been won, am I right in saying, by the team that lost the previous year's playoff final. So that's you don't want to face Brentford in case that keeps on. In case in terms of playing them in the semi-final, there is there is always that chance of, you know, Derby had it a few years ago where a team that is perilously close continuously just keeps falling at the last hurdle having the chance to inflict that is quite a nice idea. I can get on get on board with that. What 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 would we think about playing Barnsley in the playoff final then? I laugh because it would have at the start of the season the prospect of both Reading and Barnsley getting to the playoff final would have seemed utterly ludicrous. But would you like to be the team that is actually, you know, all of a sudden, because, you know, whoever we play in a semi-final, as it stands, we're going to be the underdog and any other team will be the underdog in the final if we get it there. How would we feel about suddenly being the the favourite, effectively, in a player final against uh, Barnsley? I don't know, Ben and, and then Roger. I, I, I think if we if we end up playing Barnsley in the um, in the final, I would I would fancy us to do that because our, it, it would have to be that our performance in the, in the semi-finals would have been so fantastic in terms of overturning a squad that on paper and in terms of quality, if we're being honest, was far superior to to Barnsley's. So what what's kind of and I Roger will probably correct me on this, but I just feel like the last few times that we've got to the playoffs, we've put all our energies into getting to the final and then not really showed up in the in the final itself. So you go back to the last one with Huddersfield and it was it was just about the worst game of football I think I've ever seen in my life. It just came down to who didn't want to lose the most. Um, and Huddersfield, you know, fair play to them. They went up and, and, you know, they kind of enjoyed their season or whatever. But I, I didn't I didn't feel we were worse than, than Huddersfield throughout the season. And I honestly felt we were going to win that game in the final and it obviously didn't turn out that way. But to, to play Barnes in the final would... I'm probably cursing it here now, really, but would be the best outcome for us. I, I really do feel like that. Um, you, I just don't want, and I've said this before, but I just don't want anything to do with Brentford in either the semi-final or the final. I just hope they go up automatically because I just want them out of the league, really, because they're just always there. Um, so, you know, as long as they can just go up automatically, then we just take what we're given, really. Um, but playing Barnes in the final would be, would be a dream, absolute dream. Yeah, might give us a, a, a better chance. The one I don't want to play and lose to again is Swansea. Um, a, we've done it before, and B, we do seem, seem to find them very difficult to beat. But it, it's tournament football. Um, you know, the, the form book kind of goes out the window when you get into the playoffs. The team that finishes third wins the playoffs 40% of the time. The other three teams have got a 20% each shout. So we'll be one of those with the, you know, historically the 20% shout. Um, but I'm taking some faith that uh, Pauno has won a tournament before, uh, even if it was, you know, the World Cup under 17s with, with Serbia. But he knows a bit about finishing in, in tournament football. So I'm hoping that will, will bring to bear. And I'd say to, to Ben, um, who wants so desperately to avoid Brentford, that Brentford are one of the few teams with a worse playoff record than Reading. So <laughs> if it was Brentford against Reading in the playoff final, one hoodoo or the other would have to break. I just it's not from that all from a historical point of view, but I just fear I mean their forward players are just phenomenal. And I just, you know, with with you'd hope that we'd have a full strength um uh, you know, d- d- defensive line for, for the game anyway. Um, but I, I just feel that we are, and we have shown sort of glimpses of naivety defensively this season. And I just feel you give anything to Brentford and they're going to score. And but, but the th- player you know, can be such a freak though, can't it? I mean, so yeah, true. Put them last time. And the keeper threw one in and there was that time that Q 
QPR beat Derby, having been absolutely mullered yeah. all day long, you know. Yeah. You know, I, I would have to say that it, it would actually make me worry even more if we, if Brentford, you know, I've not actually looked into it, but as you say, if they have a worse playoff record than us, me and my dad have long joked that if you have a bad run or a terrible hoodoo, bring it to Reading and we'll find a way <laughs> to end it for you. We'll, yeah, that's true. We yeah. will be that team. So, yeah, that would probably actually make me worry even more. Um, so, yeah, you know, 10 games to go. Funny, I think actually what might be more telling in those 10 games is that we have to play, yeah, Norwich probably gone, but we've still got to play Watford, still got to play Swansea, still got to play Barnsley. Um, who knows? Um, and we've actually still got to play Cardiff. So who knows what could, um, if, if, we turn, if we turn over all of those teams in the regular season, then suddenly our playoff hopes will, will be boosted considerably. And um, let's do... Final question then from the mailbag before you go into news bites. Rodemar Janoszak, and if you want to go and see this for yourself, um, I'll retweet it when the podcast goes out. But um, he says, this is a painting from 1913 by the great futurist Umberto Boccioni called Dynamism of a Football Player. Don't you think there's something of Andy Rinomoto about it? Or perhaps Yakumete scoring that scissor kick against Rotherham. Now, if you have a look at this, um, there's, I cannot describe it to you. Maybe I should have asked Waldemar to send us a voice clip to describe it, as he is the pro in this. But um, looking through it myself, I must say, um, my initial uh, reaction towards it is to drawn in, you know, front and the top top centre of the is a kind of eye-like image. And I would have to say, Waldemar, that. For me, that's Velko Paunovic seeing through the haze of the uh, and the madness of the football game to judge the perfect approach and to uh, to create a winning formula through that. So hopefully, that is something. If the, if art people can tell me that that's either good or terrible analysis, then do do be in touch. But yeah, I'll throw that. I don't know if either of you guys um, had a chance to check that out. But, yeah, um, I mean, when I saw it earlier, I just, I, it just, it was just a picture that I would describe as whatever the object was being everywhere. And I suppose if you're comparing that to to Ridden Motor, then that would be fair, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. But then yeah, I kind I of, and then I, I, I thought about it a bit too much, and then I kind of went down a rabbit hole with it. So then I just stopped. But yeah, I, <laughs> I think from from my point of view, whatever the image is supposed to be, it's kind of, it's repeated, or it seems like it's repeated a little bit. Um, and that was my that was my first take on it, but I'm I'm not I don't have an eye for art at all. So, oh well, I'm sure I haven't seen it. And to take take on a painting I haven't seen over the <laughs> over an audio only medium, <laughs> a senior art critic and an old mate is probably not my back. So I'll pass. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, if you if you're falling down the rabbit hole of of in, of, of analysis with it, then I'm sure Voldemort might be absolutely delighted to hear that. That's the, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I think um, I'll, I'll read a couple of the prize. Paul Gorford saying, um, "Umberto Boccioni pacing use it for a spot the ball competition," and Bill Cummings saying, "It's a murky, shallow piece that has some energy, but is more workaday than you suggest." So yeah, there's all kinds of rabbit holes you can fall down with this sort of stuff. And um, any more paintings that people want us to compare to footballers, absolutely send them in. And as Roger says. For a podcast, it really is the, uh, the best content that we can deliver. So, with that in mind, let's go into news bites now and um, and talk about what's been going on around the club this week. Stay tuned for all the latest from around the Medeski Stadium and the Championship with news bites. So, as we uh, come into news bites, then I'll let you know what's been going on with the other teams around Reading in just a bit. But as we have Roger here, we thought we'd get an update on what's been going on at Star and the other, you know, political world of football fandom, as it were, at the moment. So, um, so Roger, I'll hand the floor over to you, and there's some, some Hall of Fame news on the way. Yes. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, as a sort of intro to all of that, about 11 months ago, a friend and I were discussing what was the biggest event in our lifetime. He said the Beatles. I said it was coronavirus. And he's recently admitted I was right on that one, because it affects absolutely everything. And one of the things it's affected is Hall of Fame. So we postponed the Hall of Fame 2020 at about 10 or 11 days notice. I think it was due the very date that uh, Boris ordered the uh, yeah. lockdown, the rather delayed lockdown. But so we waited a long time to uh, hope uh, in the hope that things would open up a bit, but they haven't. So we've gone down a different tack. We are doing the Hall of Fame 2020 on Sunday, the 21st of March, i.e. a week 
today in terms of the time of the recording um, and we're doing it online. It will be available via the Reading Football Club YouTube and Facebook channels. We've got 25 new inductees. We've got interviews with several of them. Um, we've got some delightful goals, including a never-before-seen hat-trick from one of our great legends. Um, and um, we hope that uh, lots of people will tune in to uh, see the show, uh, 7.30, Sunday the 21st of March. Um, and we hope that uh, the next one we do after that will be later this year, you know, late in the autumn, and that we'll be able to do it again as a live event, as we have before in the Medeski Stadium. And we'll invite these inductees to join us live in front of an audience of Reading fans, because that's what really brings it alive, is people seeing their legends as it were in the same room and it's been great in the recent past where we've had people like Johnny Walker and Jimmy Wheeler uh, coming along um, to, to meet fans old and new you know and in previous years we've had obviously the likes of uh, Nicky Shorey, Graham Murty, Kevin Doyle have all, all made a, a big effort to come along to the live event so that's Hall of Fame and that's at 7.30 p.m. on the is it Reading YouTube channel on the Sunday 21st of March. Yeah, yeah. There's this kind of five-minute countdown before the show starts. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. No, oh, brilliant. Well, I mean, for, from a personal point of view, it's, it's so sad that it's not in the in the flesh because we, the Tarnas stand always had a, a desk down there for people to come and say hello and everything like that, usually doing a recording there and I'd, I'd have the chance to to run around with a microphone and, and interview various Reading stars um, of the past and everything and as I remember we had one time of, of Brian McDermott and Kevin Doyle together having a little chat with us which I th thoroughly enjoy putting out to, to friends who love those two and I can just lay that on the table so that was yeah those those always good fun we'll hopefully have those as you say back later in the year but yeah 7 30 PM on Sunday on the uh, we'll share it obviously on the Tyler Center everything like that. Um, so that should be a really uh, interesting watch. So yeah, thank you for putting that together because I can yeah. imagine that um, you know various interviews and everything doing over the last few months would have been a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> it's much more work than actually doing it live as it as it turns out. But we've got quite an interesting uh, collection of people all the way from the eighteen uh, seventies to the. Uh, 2010s uh, are coming in and as you rightly say Mark it is a bit of a community event when we can do it live with yourself and people from the Reading Sunday League and uh, collectors and historians and, and other groups associated with the uh, use the dread term the Reading football family but um, yep we're online this time and hopefully back live next time. Absolutely. And just also for yourself, you've, um, you emailed me the other week saying that you're part of the, the Football Supporters Association National Council. And I wanted to ask you about what that is and in terms of if anyone had any you know, thoughts or general suggestions about you know, the nature of, fan, of being a fan these days or, or you know, obviously for the, for the future and the, the, the semi-post-COVID world and hopefully ultimately the post-COVID world how, you know, whether they can they can be in touch with you to, for suggestions and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, my um, my position is I'm an elected member of, uh, as a championship club representative. So there are also representatives from uh, Cardiff and Coventry and we represent the other 24 um, or the other 21 championship clubs. So there is quite a big uh, national council structure of about 30 odd different representatives which include people from the non-league game, the Premier League, the women's game, fans for diversity, and indeed, um, you know, websites and, and fanzines uh, as, as individual members. Uh, we're really there to, uh, as you say, pick up things from our own grassroots and try and translate that into a national picture. And at the same time, disseminate what's happening at the centre of football politics out to... Um, our clubs, our members, and our supporters in general. And I think there are two things that are going on at the moment, two, if you like, competing pressures. Um, firstly, 
On the good side, the good news, um, the progressive agenda, the Football Supporters Association has set up this Sustain the Game campaign, which is essentially about uh, pushing good governance and proper financial controls of football clubs. And I think the hope is ultimately to work towards some kind of independent regulator that can enforce policies that are good for the game on everybody in the game so that the game doesn't uh, fall under the burden and the pressures that the very big clubs put on everybody else. And that is bolstered by the fact that the government, the new government we have, has a manifesto promise to bring about a fan-led review of football governance. Uh, they've only been in office about six months. Is it six months? No, 18 months, isn't it? Mm. All right. Um, and they've had a few things on their plate. Um, but uh, we're hopeful that that is beginning to kick off and that the Football Supporters Association is going to try and drive the fan-led element of that. Um, so that's on the good side. But on the bad side... COVID is going to be a hell of a shock to the game and we don't know what's going to come out at the other side. But you can already see that National League South, um, where Hungerford play, has been suspended for the second year in a row. In the National League, Dover seem to have stopped uh, playing. I'm not sure whether they're still trading or not, um, but there are many games behind in the National League. Uh, there's all kinds of pressures on smaller clubs and the government and have not provided the funds that one might have expected uh, to support institutions that are very valued and established within their local communities. So in a time of crisis, the ones with the deeper pockets uh, seek to take advantage, I think. And we've already seen Project Big Picture floated by Liverpool and Manchester United, which was shot down fairly quickly. Uh, and that was an attempt to basically grab power within the within the Premier League. Um, today I'm reading about all the big European clubs trying to expand the Champions League. Next, I think it's from next season or, or, or maybe the season after, but more and more European games. And what that does is it suppresses the attention and the amount of spare fixture space for clubs playing at our level. Um, they dominate the calendar. And the other thing that's happened with COVID is that TV football, even for us via iFollow, has become the norm. We don't know how many people are going to go back when we're allowed back in the stadiums. You know, people have got out of the habit and a lot of football has been about the habit. So um, those are the two things, two things that are going on. Um, and, you know, we hope that the progressive side works because that is the side that certainly I favour for all kinds of reasons and I think all Reading fans should favour because you know we're in that bucket as opposed to the bucket that says Juventus, Real Madrid, Manchester United and Liverpool on it. Yeah no it's, it's, it's really interesting um, debate is going on and and if anyone, you know, if these sort of things like fan-led reviews and everything, anything like that, if anyone wants to send in their, their thoughts or suggestions we can pass on to, to Roger and everything like that, then send them over to the Tyler at gmail.com because, you know, I, I think it's it's obviously such a, as you say, it's a, it's a nexus point really in terms of a, a crossroads, the, what's going to happen next in terms of are we going to go more down one way, more down the other. I think the chances that we're just going to return to how things were pre-COVID are really, really slim, particularly, as you say, TV football. They tried to do a box office for the Premier League, whether I think the, the advent of 3pm Premier League fixtures has basically gone now. I can't imagine they'll go back to that. And and for Reading fans, how I follow and all that sort of stuff, well, if we're in the Championship, how that's going to affect us. So, it is a it's a really important time and it's you know we need fans on these sorts of things who are, are taking an extra interest and and putting forward good points of view so it's good to have that certainly from a reading perspective i think but really i think um you know in the in the short term at least perhaps you know <laughs> it's, it's an obvious cliche isn't it but the only thing that reading can do to secure their future as a as a power and a club and all this sort of stuff is to get promoted i suppose isn't it really <laughs> Yeah, but that'll cost me my job. But I don't mind. <laughs> it's a voluntary role. 
And um, the point you make about 3 p.m. kickoffs in the Premier League, that is one of the very, very, you know, salient issues that the Football Sports Association want to push back on. You know, no, you know, you've had this because of the emergency, but you can't keep it. And I think the same will apply with the number of substitutions and substitution breaks. Um, that's been put in as a consequence of the COVID emergency. Uh, that favours bigger clubs, you know, the more subs you can have. Um, maybe there'll be pushback on that as well. Well, the Premier League managed to push back on that and boy, did they put up a fuss. So let's see how it goes with things that, that properly impact economically and everything like that. So, so yeah, as I say, if anyone has any... Um, you know, suggestions and anything like that. We're happily pass on those messages. Um, before, let's go into the Birmingham um, game in just a second. But before we do that, um, news bites uh, for the rest of the football club women's team. Not a great week for the women's team, actually. Um, defeated at Bristol City um, on Monday in a nil-nil draw with Spurs on Sunday. So just kind of, you know, a bit, bit of a stodgy season, really, I suppose. Sixth in the in the... WSL, which in and of itself is a is a really good achievement, given that there's you know the, the likes of Man United have emerged this year, and and Reading have more or less held their place in amongst that, and and obviously it's a it's a in terms of as a league, its financial disparity is is quite alarming, but Reading are holding their own in that, and and sixth place is probably where they'll finish this season. So not a great week results wise, but hopefully it's a. You know, can be a good end to the season. The under 23s beat Crystal Palace on Friday. Goals from Jaden Onan and Femi Aziz. Also saw Lewis Gibson playing in that as he ter- returns from injury. They're third in Premier League two. Under 18s, they drew 2 2 with Crystal Palace. So they are 10th in the league. Right then, big match preview time. There's a game on Wednesday night. Be loud and be proud and back the boys and make some noise. Come on, you ours! Shout out to this week's podcast sponsor, ZCZ Films, showing that age is no barrier to being a hooli hoop. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have a Sky Sports red button fixture on Wednesday night, uh, 7.45pm, Birmingham City away. And this has been the ideal chance for revenge for that defeat at the Madstad earlier in the season. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, Birmingham are, are in free fall at the moment. Um you know, they've lost 12 at home this year, I think it is, or this season. You would expect that we would um, make that 13. Obviously, rumours of, of, of Karanka potentially quitting between or, or resigning or being sat between now and, and the game. So, yeah, it, I, I, this is a good game to, to kind of get the shooting boots back on and, and just go for it. The key thing really is is the personnel, you know, whether or not, as we mentioned earlier, whether Mate is fit enough to start. But if he does, you, you, you can't see anything but a, a Reading win, really. Um, you know, 3-0 th- at home to, to a Bristol City side who, yesterday, who, you know, I kind of have been a little bit resurgent under Pearson, but a, a nothing special, as we know. Um, and it, it just doesn't look good for Birmingham at all. Um, coupled with the fact that, that Rotherham have, have got, what three or four games in hand over them as well down there, so it's it's going to get very messy for Birmingham, and they've they've been on the brink for for a number of years really. Um, but but heading back to this game, I I, I really can't see us um, messing this one up. I think he's learned his lesson from from the Wiccan game a few weeks back, and he will know that a win is is you know I don't like the word in this context, but almost compulsory here because it, they have to be putting these teams to bed in in order to stay in the playoffs and. And really cement the position up there. So, yeah, it 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 does look like um like a Reading win, really, for me. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll, issue, I'll issue a hasty retraction because I've just checked, and it is main event Sky Sports. So you don't have to uh, you don't have to big, press the red button night. to watch this game. So um, excellent. Slightly, dim- so I guess that just means better coverage, doesn't it? So that's good. But yeah, um, main event is seven forty-five kickoff. Um, we've had a late question actually, and I'll throw this to you, Roger. Peter's tweeted us saying, "Would you rest Lucas Yao for the Birmingham game and start Yakimate and Puskas? Maybe a rest would do him good, and this is a good game to let him rest." He says, "No, I'd stick him out there. It's a must-win game, and he might score a hat trick." Well, I mean, we've got, good, we've got a good <laughs> record at Birmingham, and yeah, you know. I'm not one of those fans. I'm not one of those people who takes each game as it comes. Um, and when you've read out that list of away games that we've got, which include Barnsley, Watford, Cardiff, and Norwich, um, presumably Birmingham's the only easy 
relatively away game we've got. So I think we've got to win that one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good point, actually. I think, um, I mean, what I'm seeing with Lucas Shaw at the moment is a player who's got everything out about his game pretty much nailed down apart from that final stick it in the net moment. And I think probably the only way you get him out of that is by letting him stick it in the net. And obviously, you know, he scored against Sheffield Wednesday, yes, but he wasn't, he was in the right places against Forrest. And although the quality of the finishes were quite low, um, it still, it bodes well, doesn't it, really? The only other thing to mention is that Ito Karanka might not actually be the Birmingham manager by the time we get to Wednesday night. It's kind of being said that he's on his way out. As Ben said, lost 3-0 to Bristol City on Saturday without um, firing in a shot on target. So do we fear a kind of new manager bounce? We kind of got, we were okay against Sheffield Wednesday, but it's not, it's probably almost we played them too late if they have got rid of Karanka. I think I think it was in the summer, you know, going back to to Birmingham, what they did. It was an interesting choice bringing him in. Really, um, I, I don't really know what Birmingham fans' ambitions were or the club's ambitions were this year. But with with the squad they've got, you know, looking down the list of players, probably the only one that stands out really is Hogan and potentially the goalkeeper Etheridge, and that's it really. Um, you know, they, they they've got they've got a really bizarre mix of players, um, and I. I just can't, I think the confidence has completely gone from them. I think, you know, you mentioned off air, Mark, about Sheffield Wednesday, and I think you're right about Darren Moore doing a, doing a job there. But I just can't see who Birmingham will get in if if Karanka does quit or, or resigns or is sacked or whatever. Um, I don't know who else they'll get in that's going to begin to try and sort this out, really. They've just got to hope that, that Rotherham don't win most of their games in hand and, and, and stay in the league next year. But... I don't think it's going to make a difference in the dugout, to be honest. Um, and going back to the Lucas Jow question, I, I wouldn't drop him either. I agree with Roger. I would I would just stick him in. I think if ever there was a game that you wanted to play three up front just to see what it looked like, this would be a good game to do that because, you know, they're leaking goals at the moment and they, they really are all over the place. Yeah, well, let's get some predictions then to round off the show. The prediction league on standings. Westy took a, a one-all draw against Forrest uh, yesterday, so he was the only man to predict that. So congratulations to him. He moves on to 22 points, and he's now three points off the lead. I'm on 25, Handbags 24, Ollie's now fourth on 21, and Sim on 16. I will kick us off then for Birmingham, and I'm going to say a 2-0 win for Reading because... I mean, Birmingham has scored 26 and 36 in the league this year. I, I, I can't see them scoring. I think this is going to be a question of whether Reading can break down a team that if they have just changed their manager, in reality, they're going to look at this game as a as a stabiliser, maybe get a point in it. So they're probably going to be lining up at the back. Whether Reading can break that down or not is a different question because our finishing has been a bit uh, dodgy at certain times this year. So I'm going to go 2-0. Roger, what are you going to say for this one? 2-1 to Reading. Ben? Uh, I'm going to go 3-0 Reading. I, I just think if we get the early goal, it's, it's going to be game over, really. And um, it, it will be a question of how many we can get. But I would I would happily take um, uh, a 3-0 win. Yeah, <laughs> I'd take a half to nil. <laughs> <laughs> we've not, I suppose we've not really put away teams this year. That's quite a, I suppose if we had a criticism, 3-0 really has been our limit. If any, if there is going to be a chance of getting a 5 nil, maybe this is it. But that's obviously very ambitious, as Roger has just pointed out. But it, I suppose that if, you know, ideal scenario, 2-0 up at half-time, the question will obviously turn to, do we start to take players off? We've got QPR on Saturday, which isn't a game that we necessarily have to look at as, you know, any more dangerous than this one. So maybe we'll push through. It's not really been this side's style. They're, when they're tuning up, they're very happy to knock the ball around and see it out. So I would anticipate that would be how we deal with it. So you can obviously keep up to date with that on the Tyler Stemical, the preview and review content as per usual. Facebook and Twitter as well. So thank you very much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Thank you very much, Roger, for popping on this week. Cheers, Mark. And Ben as well. Always a pleasure. No problem, Mark. Thank you. And um, looking forward to next week, Roger. Should be good. So uh, good luck with it all and, um, and have a good week kind of finishing it off. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. As I say, the uh, 7.30 on next Sunday, the 21st, is the Star Hall of Fame. We will certainly be tuning in and we'll be tuning in as well for 7.45pm on Wednesday night. Birmingham versus Reading. It's that game. It's just another game that we have to win. And 
quite frankly, going into these games thinking that we are going to win is part of the joy in and of itself. So let's hope we live up to that and come on, you arse. You smile, funny how the crowns always be